Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our podcast. Today, we're going to bring you an excerpt from our interview with Elaine Shirley. Elaine is manager of the Rare Breeds Program at Colonial Williamsburg. For those of you who aren't familiar with Williamsburg, here's the skinny. You can go to their website for more details and pictures and other information. But they say they are the world's largest living history museum. And I believe it. It's a pretty amazing place. I remember my mom talking about taking us there when we were little, and I won't tell you how long ago that was. Colonial Williamsburg is a private foundation owning a historic district in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's a living example of Colonial America, set on 300 acres. There are over 40 sites and trades, four historic taverns, and two world-class art museums. The little township nearby is a little bit touristy, like any place close to a big attraction. That's kind of to be expected. Once you actually go inside, it's very different. At Williamsburg, they want you to feel like you've stepped back in time to the 1700s. All of the workers are in period costume, and many speak in an older style of formal speech. You can visit a foundry, a gunsmith shop, or a blacksmith shop in a public armory with workers demonstrating the activities that would have gone on. It's pretty cool to actually see somebody running a red-hot forge. And no, it doesn't actually work exactly like when Thor commissioned that big metal thing. Kind of, but not really. Anyway, at Williamsburg, you can fire a flintlock musket, quaff ale and a leg of lamb in the tavern, or stomp around in clay. There are carriage and wagon rides, both horse and ox drawn. Just a note, it's a beautiful area, but if you want to get around the square in under an hour, choose the horses. While we were there, George Washington rode across the square on an American cream draft horse, and he stopped in the middle of a group of people to answer questions about his farm and life as a general. If all things were equal, they probably would have had George ride across the square on a mammoth jack donkey, since he was integral to the foundation of that breed. But I guess Williamsburg was going for majestic instead of practical on the day we were there. Sometimes you might meet Thomas Jefferson walking around, or a Native American, or two boys in tricorn hats driving a pair of oxen. And most all of the reenactors have a pretty accurate knowledge of that time period, as many of them have history degrees. They tell you to try and stump George or Thomas with some esoteric question. Of course, me being me, I asked George about his ass. He answered, but he was not amused, even though I did call it a donkey. Of course, the thing that brought us there in the first place was the animals. For the exhibits and demonstrations, Williamsburg tries to stay true to costumes, but also the livestock that would have been historically correct for that period as well. There's a herd of Lester Longwell sheep, and they go over the history of Robert Bakewell. He's the guy who really got the world serious about selective breeding for trade, and his Lester Longwells are the quintessential example of his efforts. There are the aforementioned American cream draft horses, of which there are only about 500 left in North America. That's the only breed of draft horse that originated in the U.S., by the way. You might see Cleveland Bay horses. There are only about 1,000 of those alive today, including about 180 in North America. Queen Elizabeth is a fancier of this rare horse, by the way. There are Canadian horses. In case you didn't know, this large black or brownish multi-purpose horse is actually an official breed with a long history. Not just a regular horse from Canada, eh? There are American Milking Devons. We'll talk more about those in the future, but if you remember our prior podcast with John and Bonnie Hall, that's the same type. Yes, they've been around that long. And last but not least, there were three or four different types of chickens on our tour. 
including Nankins and Dominiques and English game fowl. There was so much to see at Williamsburg that we were there all afternoon, and Elaine was truly helpful in showing us around. We'll bring you to other parts of Williamsburg and that adventure on another podcast. But today, we're going to talk about the Nankin chickens. The Nankin is definitely a heritage breed. If you ask the Livestock Conservancy, they're one of the oldest known bantam chickens. For all of you non-chicken people, true bantams are small naturally. That's without the breeding down for size thing that goes on with some of the full-size chicken breeds that have become bantams, but only through selective breeding for trait. Most bantams are about the size of a dove. That means that the space requirements are less than a full-size chicken might need. And I can tell you that my Belgian Dukla bantam chickens lay at the same rate as my good layers, even if the egg is about half the size. All in all, it's a pretty good trade. Anyway, there's evidence that the Nankins arrived in England prior to the 1500s, and maybe even before that time. As Elaine will tell you, they're known to be broody, so some farmers keep them just to hatch eggs. Though I will say that a dove-sized chicken sitting on more than one full-sized chicken egg makes me smile just thinking about it. Maybe we should get a video of that sometime. On our tour, Elaine brought some lettuce over to feed the flock, so they all came running over to us immediately. These little guys were very friendly and sociable, active, and talkative chickens, as you can hear in the background. You might imagine a bunch of happy kindergarten kids running around the person handing out Rice Krispie treats at recess. It was kind of like that. On our YouTube Backyard Green Films channel, we have an Agriculture Podcast Extra video up there about our visit to Colonial Williamsburg. Just look for Elaine Shirley's name and the picture of those big red milking devons munching hay. In the meantime, we hope you enjoy the selection from our day with Elaine Shirley, the person in charge of the Rare Breeds Program at Colonial Williamsburg, and very deservedly so. Tell me, what is it that you do here? I take care of the uh, sheep, the cattle, and the poultry at Colonial Williamsburg. My title uh, is Manager of Rare Breeds, and our sheep, our cattle, and our poultry are all rare breeds of livestock. So. Part of what I do is kind of general farming work to feed them and give them the veterinary care that they need and lamb and calf. But then a big part of what I do is also to interpret to our visiting public and help them understand how livestock's different in the 18th century. And because the animals are a little different uh, and because I want our visitors to think we have breeds of livestock that are rare today, but are breeds that very easily could have been here in the 18th century. The uh, town was um, established as a town in 1699 when the um, capital moved here. There was a settlement here in the 17th century. I don't honestly know the exact day or you know the exact year that Williamsburg started, when it first started, it was called Middle Plantation. And it's the high point between the James River and the York River. Mm -hmm. So it became the capital in 1699, um, partly because Jamestown being close to the water caused a lot of issues with mosquito-borne diseases and the water wasn't very good. And so they moved here to Williamsburg. And it was the capital until 1780 when, um, during the revolution it was realized that the British could bomb the capital city from uh, either of the rivers, the James or the York. All right, we're gonna go in this gate here and have a look at these chickens. So the chickens that we have here are Nankin Bantams. And they're lovely little chickens. They are originally a breed of chicken from the Orient. And I'm gonna give them a little bit of uh, chicken treats so they'll hopefully come close by where we can see them. Hey girls, Look at, no, don't come out. You can't be coming out. Look at that. So the Nankin is a bantam and bantams um, are 
small chickens. Now with the craze in chickens today, there are a lot of breeds that have been miniaturized. You select the smallest and then the smallest and then the smallest and you get a miniature version. These are what are called true bantams because they don't have a large counterpart. They were not miniaturized. Um, and we see bantams on inventories. We also see uh, letters where people write about raising bantams, particularly young women. Uh, it's a good way for them to learn about the poultry yard because this is a woman's responsibility in the 18th century, taking care of poultry. And so a good way to start is with bantams. They're kind of a, a fun little thing. And we have them here at Mr. Witt's house because he's very wealthy. And so he doesn't have to have chickens for eggs or meat production. He can have them for fun. Yeah, how are they for meat and eggs? Uh, they do lay eggs very, very well. Uh, they produce meat, but as you can see, they're awfully small. So they wouldn't really make a complete meal. The main reason this breed was uh, kept around was because the females get very broody and they do a very good job of sitting on the eggs of game birds, pheasants and quail primarily, um, so that if you want to go shooting with your friends, you need to raise the birds to shoot. And so these birds will sit on those eggs. And this summer we actually had a lady call us and say, I have a quail uh, and I have quail and I have fertile eggs. And I said, oh, bring them to me and we'll put them under a nankin hen and and she hatched them out so it was neat to see them do what they had originally been uh, selected to do they not only will hatch them but they'll raise them it, well yes i mean with birds all they're doing is telling the little birds to come eat here you know they're they're not providing them with any sustenance like a cow or a sheep would but uh yeah she that's the clicky noise right there going on. That might right. do that too. Right, right. And that's partly what that rooster's doing. He's saying, oh, come over here, come over here. There's something to eat. Beautiful so, birds. They are. They're lovely birds. And, and it's a shame that they are so rare because particularly in this backyard chicken raising uh, frenzy that we're in right now, um, <laughs> This would be a great breed of chicken for backyard flo flocks. I noticed you have the, the fishing um, netting over the top. That's a great thing. Yes, and the primary reason we have that there is to keep the hawks out, not to keep the chickens in. But does it keep other predators out, like raccoons? No, not, no. Last, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, the uh, the primary thing that seems to like to go through this net are squirrels. <laughs> we have a whole population of squirrels that know that there's chicken feed in that chicken pen. And so they chew holes in the netting and then go in and eat the chicken food. So the chickens get shut up at night. Um, in the morning when we go around town and we feed and check waters, one of the things we do is open up all our chicken pens. And then at the end of the day, we shut all our chicken pens up because we have raccoons, possums, um, dogs, cats, I mean, pretty coyotes. We have pretty much anything that wants to eat a chicken around here, so. <laughs> now, I, I notice as, as we see the chickens, you're seeing that, is it it's shells? Or what are, what are we looking at below this here? Um, you're looking at a lot of oyster shell. Remember, we're between two rivers. There's a tremendous amount of oysters being produced here. Um, when the uh, folks came to Jamestown, they found huge piles of oyster shells that the Indians had produced. So uh, it's a good way to keep things relatively dry. Um, so when it rains, this stays drier than if we didn't have the oyster shell. Does the calcium impact the animals that you raise here in any way, shape, or form? Obviously, the chickens are probably, if they peck at it, it's good for them. Um, Cell production. I'm yeah, yeah, it probably is good for them. The feed that we give them has oyster shells in it. So it, and that's actually probably overkill on our part, considering they have oyster shells around them all the time. Um, I don't know that it impacts any of the other animals, to be honest, because where it tends to be is paths and all of our chicken yards have um, oyster shells in them so that when it rains, we don't end up with lots of puddles. We do end up with puddles, but. Uh, I would think that in terms of the management of the livestock here, there's all kinds of things in a place that's attempting to preserve an old way of life. 
with a livestock that's from an old way of life, but that has evolved to a modern way of life. Are there any issues like that that you can think of that you have to deal with? Oh, yes, yes. Um, one of the big things about showing livestock in front of the public is you always have to be conscious of what the public who does not understand livestock is going to think about what's going on. So um, these girls are all getting a little older. We do have some leg issues. We have some limping that goes on just simply because they're old. You know, I'm starting to limp too. And But you have to think, how is the public going to perceive that? And the best example of what hadn't occurred to me, I came from a production farm, uh, and so one of the things that you do with sheep is you put a crayon on the male. You put a, a crayon right on his chest so he marks the females, and then you can record who he's marked, and you sort of know when lambs are coming. Well, the first year I was here, I put a red crayon on, and within about two days of him having the crayon, he started marking them, and people started calling and saying, why are they bleeding? Why are they bleeding? So I never buy red crayons either to mark heads because when we catch the animals, particularly the sheep, we'll mark them because their ear tags are so small you can't see them easily. So we mark them to point out that we've caught them. So no red crayons. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things you don't really, I'm, I have, I'm either cursed with or blessed with intellectual curiosity. So I actually knew what the red marker was, but sometimes they're blue, sometimes they're green. Yep. The very smart way of telling the farmer a lot of information, mm -hmm. who's been bred by who, what year it might be, et cetera, et cetera, in a very simple way. Which mm -hmm. I, as you go through here, there's all these tools that I look at that I say, wow, that ladle would be perfect for skimming, or that plant water, that's perfect. Why hasn't somebody done that? It's because we have a tendency to think that the new way must be the better way. Exactly. And yet, it parallels to heritage breeds to me, because they take care of themselves to some extent. They're exactly. Practical. That really definitely appeals to me. So, what other breeds of chicken do you have here at Williamsburg? Well, at the moment, we uh, are actively breeding two breeds: the Nankin Bantam here and the Dominic Chicken, uh, who's at Weatherburn's Tavern, which is farther down the street, and. I actually gave conscious thought to where I was putting specific chickens. Mr. With is wealthy, so he can afford to have chickens for fun. But Henry Weatherburn's trying to make a living as a tavern keeper. And so what he wants from his livestock uh, is profit. And so he has birds that lay eggs for him, but are also big enough that you could eat them. You could present them on the table. And so he could make a little bit more money because he's producing his own food instead of buying it at the market. We are looking um, to bring in at least one more breed and possibly two. We have two different sites in town who are expressing interest in having chicken coops. Uh, Mr. Randolph, Peyton Randolph, who was a very wealthy man and a very influential man in the 18th century and very easily could have been the first president of the United States, although he died um, before the war was over. And so nobody knows about Peyton Randolph today, but he's uh, looking to have chickens in his backyard again. So we're debating um, what breed would be good. We're looking at Derbyshire red caps, which are uh, a kind of medium sized chicken. They are very, very rare. Glenn Drowns actually raises Derbyshire red caps, and I think he's about the only person in the United States who does. That's scary to me. It is scary. Um, but I feel like if we get a group here we get people who say, oh, I have chickens in my backyard. Oh, I have a 4-H poultry club. I feel like I could get them distributed to an audience that Glenn Drowns might not hit. The other breed we're looking at are Dorkings, which are big birds. Um, so uh, meat and egg production, but primarily meat. They were um, developed to be big birds, partly for the London table trade. Um, there's actually a town outside of London called Dorking, and they have the Dorking rooster as their city mascot. <laughs> um, so those are the two breeds I'm currently looking at. The blacksmiths are also interested in chickens, and they like Sussex. So uh, 
we'll probably get them a breed that they're interested in. So we uh, we've actually seen a couple of of dorking breeders so far. It's my understanding that genetic pool is a little small, and they're having to bring back things like the five toes at the expense of other traits, or sometimes you make a decision. So the the pool is an interesting thing too. If you if you at this at this level here can have other considerations, and you have a distribution network, so to speak your secondary right. market, then it actually really gives you a strong incentive to get a, a really strong line going because then people will come to you, correct? Right, right. Um, and, and, you know, a big part of what we do is we save hatching eggs all spring, summer, and into the fall. Um, we collect the eggs that are fertile from those two breeds, from the Nankin and the Dominic, and we keep them down at the barn and we have people who, who get them. Either they come to our livestock talk and we talk about it and they say, ooh, I have a broody hen at home. <laughs> or, um, you know, they have worked with us over the years and they call us and say, I'm coming to Williamsburg. Will you have some eggs available? Now, when you feed these chickens, it, it's a very different thing that they used to do back in the old day. Now, what would the chickens eat? At, in, in the 1800s. <laughs> in the 18th century, um, chickens would not have eaten a lot of grain. That's what we tend to feed chickens today. And that is actually what we feed these chickens today is grain and then supplemental stuff. But 200 years ago, they would have gotten a lot of garden waste. So when you picked the peas, you'd throw the pea vines into the chickens. Um, they would get a lot of household waste, so moldy bread, um, maybe a pumpkin that ha was rotten on the bottom and you didn't want to use. So they are not unlike pigs in the fact that they're sort of uh, garbage, not necessarily garbage disposals, but they eat a lot of stuff that humans don't want to eat. Opportunistic omnivores is what I always call them. <laughs> Whatever's available yes. and they can catch, it often it goes in the gullet. Yes, yes. Um, now, you would have fed um, grain to fighting cocks. Uh, and they're a whole different genre of poultry in the 18th century. You essentially have backyard birds, even in a fancy backyard like the With House. Uh, and then you have sporting birds, the birds used for cockfighting. So the second most popular sport in Virginia second only to horse racing in the 18th century. Wow. Wow. Well, these are beautiful little birds. I can see how this is one that people might look at and say, hey, I could have a chicken. Yes, yes. And they are very, very friendly birds. Um, the one concern about the red caps is I don't remember. We had them at one point, And I don't remember if they were particularly friendly. And to a certain extent, that's going to be what's going to be a selling point to the public, you know, if they're friendly. But I mean, these guys, you practically have to kick them out of the way to get into the poultry pen. Well, you know, with the number of people that come through here, biosecurity is one of those things that immediately comes to my mind because I would be very nervous to have anybody in this neck of the woods this close to my chickens, especially God knows where they came from, right? <laughs> So, I mean, this is one of the areas where heritage breeds might have an advantage, I would think, in that they're pretty sturdy and a lot of them are pest resistant, disease resistant, correct? Correct. Uh, rare, the, the breeds that are rare today quite often have survived simply because they do well on their own. They don't get a lot of uh, input and they just take care of themselves. We're talking about you. He's a beautiful little rooster, isn't he? <laughs> Gorgeous. So is that, is that... In, when you make the breeding choices here, mm -hmm. is that one of your consider or, or um, uh, breed choices, I guess you should say, is that one of your considerations? We want a breed that does X, Y, and Z. We want, we want one that maybe could handle thousands of people coming by to look every day. Um, I don't know that, that that is part of our consideration. Probably the biggest part of the consideration when we're trying to decide what breed of livestock to have is a breed that could possibly have been here in the 18th century. One of the big issues is you don't see breeds listed as breeds really until the 19th century. So we have to go by um, drawings, descriptions, and occasionally people say, I got a cow from Devon. So then you can sort of make the leap of faith that it's a Devon cow. <laughs> um, so that's what I tend to use as the criteria. And there are, 
you know, probably, I don't know, 15 breeds of chickens that I could display here. And part of what I've selected for were breeds that I felt we could help because the fact that so many people do come through here, there are going to be more people who will get it. Um, as opposed to the number of people who would go to a poultry show, those are all going to be people who, who made the conscious effort to go to a poultry show. We're going to get people here who made the conscious effort to come to Williamsburg, but then maybe get sucked in by these chickens or the sheep or the cattle, and they go away saying, wow, I never really thought about that, but maybe I want Nankin chickens. They say that uh, chickens are the gateway drug. That's they, they certainly are. <laughs> Yeah, for, for me, definitely, it has been, that has been the case. Oh. Bees now, too, in addition. But, yeah. yeah. So, so do you have people that come in and actually know what a heritage breed is, or do they just assume that it's like the people that are actors here, that it's sort of put on, and maybe that's a chicken that is in a setting that looks like it could be, but do you think they really understand? We certainly do have a, a increasing number of people who understand rare breeds and who understand that it's important to keep that gene pool of uh, old livestock going. It, it definitely, I've been here 30 years, we've had rare breeds for 30 years. We started out with a Devon cow named Nora and in the beginning people did not understand it. Now we still have a lot of people who don't understand it or who you really have to work at it to get them to realize that not all milk cows are Holsteins and not all beef cattle are Angus and that we need the diversity in the world. But I am very grateful that there are more and more people who come up and say, oh, I've read about your rare breeds. Oh, I know somebody who has Lester sheep. Oh, I raise Dominic chickens at home. You have people come here from all over the world, I'm assuming. We do. Do you have people that identify with many of these breeds because they're a part of the cultural heritage that, you know, for instance, for me, my Belgian Duclas were initiated a hundred years, uh, I mean, a hundred miles from where my grandfather was born uh -huh. in Belgium. And I have a nice little soft, warm feeling from that. <laughs> do you have people that say, oh, the Red Devons, they initiated blah, 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 or do, do they get any of that? Or is it kind of just, oh, look at the pretty chicken and isn't it cute? And oh, it was alive 300 years ago. Um, we do get a few, and I will emphasize, few people who come in and say, oh, my family is from Devon, or oh, I know who Robert Bakewell is, um, and that's why I'm interested in Lester Sheep. Um, but again, in the beginning we had none, so even having a few means that the message is getting out. So, And certainly... There are way more visitors who see my animals but don't see one of the members of Coach and Livestock, so we don't hear all the um, memories from people. But quite often when you're shutting up chickens or feeding sheep, you do hear people say, oh, my grandfather had chickens just like that. Now, that might not be true, but <laughs> it, it at least gives them a soft spot in their heart for these chickens. Now that actually brings up one of the things that we've discovered. I, I, we were talking to Jeanette Berenger at the Livestock Conservancy, and it's the pockets of animals that have genetic material that are potentially useful, that are interesting to find in many ways. But finding those pockets is, is it, the very nature of the thing that's kept them alive, keeps them out of circulation and out of the public eye. So mm -hmm. how do you find these people that have great genetic material because they've been isolated and yet, and yet, you know, they, the person could pass away and the kids just sell the sheep or sell the marsh tackies and off they go and Joe Schmo has it and they don't know what they have. Right. Yeah, that, that's got to be a, a, the, the, very, the very nature of the isolation of some of these breeds has both helped and hurt them greatly, I would think. Do, do, the, you, uh, do you share the genetic material with places like uh, the USDA and their germ, uh, their, their germplasm facility? Um, we have um, sent germplasm to a variety of places, including SVF. Um, we have worked with them um, sending animals up there. <laughs> and uh, certainly any time we ask, we try to help out as much as, as we can. So yes, um, and we've been members of the Livestock Conservancy for 30 years because the work that they're doing is very important. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. 
and please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We want to thank Elaine Shirley for joining us today and for the wonderful tour of Colonial Williamsburg. If you'd like more information about Williamsburg, please visit colonialwilliamsburg.com. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. If you'd like more information about the Nankin Chicken, please visit the Livestock Conservancy at livestockconservancy.org. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.